welcome to my spoken word channel. My name is Stephen Lackey, but like any other label, that name is simply a collection of letters that make sounds to convey meaning, a meaning which may have varying connotations for those who voice and or hear it. The spoken word is much the same, its effect ranging from dissonance to resonance, apathy to revulsion, sometimes even to the same person over time. I'll be doing a special reading today, a two-part fable of my own composition, offering analysis of its inspiration and content. If you find it appealing, heartening, or evocative, or even not worth remembering, please consider the aforementioned variability of response. Words, much the same as attitudes, friendships, and even the air we breathe, may teach us, transform us, or pass uninspiringly in this moment. But the next is yet to be defined. Herein are my copyrighted works, all rights reserved, but please forget the name and remember the message. Also, feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Today's reading is called Earth, Giver of All Things, as Part 1, and The Cluster in the Glade, as Part 2. Part 1 Long ago, when humanity was young and more deeply inquisitive, Earth took notice. As the giver of all things, she bestowed powerful abilities to those who worked toward their betterment and that of others, to those who crafted for the love of the process, and to those generous enough to share their gifts. She granted teachers the ability to expand the minds and hearts of those who came near. She granted farmers the strength to till the soil that the hungry might be fed. She granted healers the knowledge of herbs and minerals that the sick might have a greater chance at life. She granted artists the dexterity to weave beauty from the ether. She granted even unskilled hands love's persistence to bear kindness and support of the others. These gifts, all of them, were magic. Some gave thanks to Earth, some did not. The gifts, however, were not contingent on praise. Humanity lives on Earth, but our gratitude was ever neither necessary nor expected. Some acted wisely, some did not. While perfect, the gifts were conferred to those who might strive to be. Wherefore they achieved or languished was a result of their efforts, not the gifts. And some chose a dark path, resenting the specifics of what they did or did not receive. In efforts to control or hoard, these conjurers sought to twist the powers of Earth herself, begging blight on those deemed lesser that their covens might achieve, masquerading enchanting beauty as proof of their deservedness of love, and wringing gluttonous eternal life that ever after they should reap their macabre rewards. Earth's sorrow at the come to call witch's misunderstanding was beyond imagining. It tore great canyons into her, stripped blanched skin into desert, wept flora into verdure, and into the hollow ache of uncountably spent grief crept numbness with anger's wraith palpable in her shadows. She could not allow the violation of the peaceful in Earth's name or otherwise, but because she loved the witches, not for their beauty nor genuflection, but that they were, despite betrayal and selfishness, her children, she would grant their wishes. The chill of night fell across her autumnal equinox, and the covens built fires for warmth. Flames arcing, sparking high, the witches reached all the higher, matching the sway of rising ash with cackling and warbling, droning and chanting as the logs crumbled before them. Bony, honeyed claws dragged at the clouds to make their rain, beseeched the moon to rest in their arms, and drew lines in the stars to predict their unending futures. All the while, Earth listened calmly, with the compassion of an understanding mother whose children had lost their way. The ground around the great fires softened, welcoming as velvet bedclothes, and the witches dug in their feet, hands still raised in supplication. Their moaning wails, once desperate, now faded into softly clicking, creaking strains lost among the breezes, and their tattered gray-brown vestments became as craggy petrichoric armor in the midnight mists of Earth's lilting oath. Hold your breath and in spring you shall beautify beyond reckoning, deify to the common and magical, and you will be eternal. 
You will feel as if you are dying, but you will return. The moon resting in your boughs each night. Artists will espy every inch and moment of you as you give rest and shade and sustenance to those who seek you out. And they will come to you as many and one, honoring you with cultivated worship, fertilized roots, and star-like adornment. They may cut you down, but still you will not die, bearing witness to the growth and passing of individuals and families, their warmth and sharing. You will see my gifts finally as they were meant to be. In these new forms, I bid you not regret your lot because your wishes have been granted and your own choices led you there. I bid you remember that mother loves you and puts none above you. And as you seed my soil living on, I bid you never lower your arms willfully, season on season, year to year, arms forever raised in celebration, not of me, but of earning your place solely by your existence, as I love you. Part two. There's a glade in the Northwood where creatures seldom venture, an eclectic ring of trees about thick scrub weed that in the rain smells of a sorrowful ash. Out of road sight, a badger path led from the edge of town to Centerwood, then on to the glade, thereafter fanning to several surroundings. In years past, there you could find an elder known to some. Merely a child when kidnapped into servitude, the witches come to call brother, nursed a stiffening heart. He had seen what the great magic had granted the creatives, the givers, the helpers. He bore witness to his sister's successful attempts to ensnare and exploit it. Bending of wills, enslavement of souls, the rawness of its naked power in their hands, and the northward glade had become his mourning temple. Individual footfalls worn from his passage, head down, tree to tree, in silent grief of their lingering punishment. At the reflecting pools outside the glade, long had echoed laments of this plight, decried perverse and unfair to the only ears still willing to listen. They may have taken what was not expressly given, yes, but they could not have done the impossible. If such power exists and it can be utilized, that seems intrinsic permission. And ripe for the taking, why should it not be? Why should they have been punished for doing what came naturally? Always at this, Earth remained tacit, having long ago compassionately explained and rendered her conclusion. She considered his questions rhetorical and harbored no desire to prove the futility of engaging those so ill-turned from penitence. With calluses hardened to digging secrets, eyes sharpened to spying clues, legs sinewed to trailing evidence, and aliases cultivated amassing an eclectic collection, brother, it seems, had not spent his life entirely in dour solemnity and ritualized resentment, and, disaffected by such miasma, he meant to abrogate his sister's sentence. Occult steeped in legendary exploits prompted treasure seekers to forge a clandestine souvenir trade populated by the witch's former holdings. As magical items used in the name of Earth Mother do retain their power unless destroyed utterly, amulets had been crafted from bone fragments and teeth, animal skins and eyes, crystals and precious metals. Chained in setting, mounted in doorways, sealed in molten glass to serve as protection by ward or threat. It's something worse than the implication of presumed power would haunt the bearers. Brother knew that by cooperative hands, the relic's power could amplify dangerously but manageably, focused through a single entity, however. Having coerced the sto or stolen the auction records, Brother would thereafter creep into the lives of the artifact's buyers, befriend them, break bread, then thieve the items, inconspicuously if possible, violently if necessary. The poor simpletons, unaware of how to truly use such charms, could not have hoped to defend against the amassing of such power. 
Unfortunately for brother, his own unawareness would come to bear, his soul-searing hunger too desperate, and te the temptation to wield what he believed to be Earth's full power inevitable. Plotting beneath his breath, shifting in the shadows, he devised a profane ritual. Into a small hollow at the center of the glade, Brother smashed the tangled turf. He sprinkled upon it a mix of ash from each of his sister's bases and just live leaves and bark from their bodies. Donning the strung amulets about his neck and a pouch of loose trinkets about his waist, he folded his remaining vestments atop the pile. A glazed cask sloshing of water, mud, and pebbles drawn from the reflecting pools was made to crown the shrine, and, kneeling beside it, Brother drifted into meditation, his eyes slitted and vacant. An hour passed as the sky meandered above, clear to wispy and back again, brother's breaths among the wind song and rising, rasping, leaking through flexed lips and nostrils, the clouds seeming to stop, his fists clenching, then riding the bellows of his anguish like spears to the cask. It burst into flame as he pierced it, the vitriolic mud squelching and screeching as it climbed his bare arms in blazes, which would have seemed as char to any wayward eyes, but he did not burn. His arms rose of their own accord, arcing umber, magenta, and vermilion from his fingertips, his thinning crown alight in streaks of black and cerulean. His body trailed, coming aloft and spinning an aching pace now above the pyre, the arcs sparking, drifting to his sisters on gritted chance. Three times he twirled in macabre revolt, slowing with each gyre. Then, at an instant within an instant, all he wore fell beneath him, matting into the hollow, as above it still he hung and the ether came alive. Without wind, the trees and grass were made to move in great forward cascades. Swiftly amidst the roar of snapping branches and lurching soil, the sky darkened with torrents of leaves and dust. He shrieked in blasphemous glee as the ring of his sisters bent toward him, but they did not disentangle. They did not disrobe, nor soften, nor reform in any way. But sap ran from their branch tips and hung in the air like starlight. For a glorious moment, he felt all manner of rage and desire, their justification rushing into him, then followed by each wept scintilla, to his ears muffling the din, to his eyes gluing them agape, to his throat choking his shrieks come to terror, come to silence. His body lurched higher, suddenly locking into a ghastly contortion, the strain visible in his every joint, limbs immobile, veins flared to bursting, eyes red, jaw clenched, levitating and imprisoned, no, calcified, as reality bent inward, buried above ground in mother's breath, a morbid monument to her vengeance fulfilled. The birds and insects racked at her eruption, their twitters swallowed in ominous absence, out of which crept a deep ringing whistle that prickled the pebbles, sifting into the hollow, finally scattering the creatures. A haunting and seductive lilt then seeped in shivers past the fizzling coals. As remorse evaded you, as compassion confounded you, as acceptance was beyond you. Not the chill of night, nor the warmth of sunlight, not the touch of human hands, nor the roots, nor teeth, nor claws of my children, not sleep, not death, nothing will touch you. Nothing will save you from me. The voice faded into what resembled a breeze and returning rustles of wary fauna. But there brother remained, eyes fixed and bulging, almost a caricature of misery, and, after a time, near comic surrealism, this ghastly harlequin its centerpiece. Season on season, for three generations, poplar and maple groaned in the breeze. Pity loomed in the branches of walnut and apple. The briars ran wild, and of the creatures, only the insects seemed yet bold or indifferent enough to return to the glade, but not to the hollow. Nothing alive dared cross the blight beneath the hovering verdict. 
Distraught, with no hope for appeasement, the witches begin traversing the borders of the glade by their sole means. Bark split and sloughed in the passing years as they strained their roots in the crossing, finally to surround the accursed patch. Unable to touch him by Earth's decree, the sisters clustered bro brother's gruesome remains in saplings, which after many springs shielded him in their aging strength, their browns and greens armoring him from outside encroachment as this wood could not be cut so close as it was to the centralized magics. The sister's bestowal was insufficient recompense to brother, yet by it he was freed from ogling mockery, and after years, lost to time, dissolved into legend, and unalone in his sorrow, beneath the weight of regret. I have always been fascinated by origin stories and creation myths. The ability to create fantastical powers, characters, and realms to accept the real yet inexplicable is an art unto itself. Part one of this fable is my first long-form attempt at this style. Over many edits of reworking Earth's voice and her verdict, I was struck by the thought of someone not getting the memo, as it were. What if this lesson from Earth went unheeded? or more pointedly, was defied. Who would do such a thing? Would Mother be, shall we say, less than understanding this time? At this speculation, I jotted the phrase, beneath the weight of regret, and it sat untended for over a year as I worked on other things. Purposely placed at the front of my composition file, I would come across that note repeatedly, as if the impetus of the regret were questioned by a child begging the story. What should I tell him? that life can be cruel, that people can live unending searches. Cautionary tales are warnings to the immature, but the phrase seemed to speak of a person who should have known better, thence evolving into one who witnessed firsthand but sought to prove his point regardless, and for that would be buried alive in his condemnation. It would be an upping of antes, nodding to the more graphic tales of the Brothers Grimm, a true horror story, the results earned, the bearer pitied, the adjudicator now feared more than loved. It is not specifically stated in part one if anyone besides brother witnessed the witch's transformations, but I do imagine anyone telling that tale as an eyewitness would be labeled a bit of a loon. Near the beginning of part two, the phrase, to the only ear still willing to listen, implies that perhaps brother tried to recount the events to people over the years, but was dismissed enough to squelch further effort. It is further unlikely that any human witness brother's punishment at the end of part two, as Earth's tumult silenced and scattered the creatures, but it is later implied that his levitating remains were espied by wanderers through the Northwood in the passage, freed from ugly mockery, lost to time, dissolved into legend. While all of the siblings' magical items were impenetrably contained within the armored hollow, it is unlikely that such events could repeat, but it is interesting to speculate on the retellings of this world's legendarium, likely heightened by the unanimous feelings of unease near the glade. Thank you for joining me today. I hope it has been some mix of enlightening, entertaining, and thought-provoking, and if not, well, perhaps another time. You could have spent it any number of ways, but I'd sincerely appreciate that you've chosen to spend this time listening to phrases I have turned. I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. Drop a comment below regarding what your own or someone else's creative writing and or spoken word has meant to you. Also, subscribe to my channel if you'd like. I'm not sure how often I'll be posting, but if you click the notification bell, you'll be among the first to know when I do. Please also consider this. I don't know exactly why you're here. But I know this much. You might be here to lead, and you might be here to follow, most likely somewhere in between, but you are not here to compare, because there is no one who does you better than you. No one could ever. Find your mode of expression, drawing, dancing, singing, speech, sculpture, gardening, volunteering, loving and supporting others, whatever your heart pleads of you. You know, it takes time, and finding your voice can seem impossible if you believe it to be somewhere hidden, lurking in the dark places that feel safe. And using that voice you already have, that can feel like begging. Begging for recognition, begging to be silenced by those whose persistence insists that they know better, but they are not you. 
Their insistence is no better than those dark places that would make your prison. There's no way to know whether or not you are on the cusp of changing your future or someone else's just by being you, not by outlandish actions steeped in heroics, just you being you. Start today. Embody the strength. Find a voice. Be heard.